I'm Ray Middleton, a system broker for Big Lottery's non-profit Fulfilling Lives program in Newcastle and Gateshead on the northeast coast of England. And today I'm going to share with you my top 10 tips for generating better dialogue when we're building helpful relationships with others. We work with those clients that mainstream services have found too difficult to engage effectively with, who also have a complex combination of needs around alcohol and drug addiction, homelessness, mental and emotional health, and offending. PI is a term coined by Robin Johnson from PyLink, which stands for Psychologically Informed Environments. PIs are promoted by a number of organizations, such as Homeless Link, as a way to improve services. We are currently piloting some PIs in Frontline Services, a homeless drop-in centre, Basis, run by Oasis Aquila, and two residential rehab services run by Mental Health Concern. PIs involve training and support for staff teams to reflect regularly on their own and their clients' thoughts, feelings and actions, including considering the influences we have on each other when building helpful relationships. This reflection is trauma-informed in that it is mindful that the majority of clients, as well as many staff, have experienced some emotional, physical, psychological or sexual traumas and neglect in their past. Part of a PI approach is to apply a framework of some kind to help people reflect on themselves and other people and consider the influence we may be having on each other through our ways of relating. Pies can have different frameworks in them, like a CBT or psychodynamic pie. This one is a dialogical pie, so it opens up and allows all possible helpful sets of ideas, including talking therapy ideas, but it is also open to a wider set of ideas outside of talking therapy. The framework I introduce considers how we all go through a problem-solving process within the bigger narratives that we live within, and it also considers if any habits of thinking, feeling and acting are causing us to get stuck in patterns of problems. This better dialogue framework around problem-solving splits into ten questions. With each question, we can open up a, and generate dialogue between different points of view within someone's social network. This gives us a social network perspective on each question, rather than just a singular one point of view. These 10 questions are simply my top 10 tips for getting better dialogue when trying to have helpful conversations. The 10 questions to ask are a really simple framework that we can all try out, and it's not rocket science. We can all get better at problem solving, as we all have problems and issues because we're human beings. Although these questions are simple, they are not easy, because to open up a dialogue about each one effectively, we need to tolerate our feelings of uncertainty in order not to close down the conversations, but to keep opening up the dialogue to new possible ways of understanding in each of the 10 areas, and new narratives that people could bring in and live their life within. So these 10 questions are one way to create better dialogue. It's not the only way, but it's one way. I've called it better dialogue to dis distinguish it from conversations that are just talking about the weather or last night's TV, because those kinds of conversations don't particularly help us to get better at life. Better dialogue is defined by those taking part in it actually get better at living life in some way as a result. They may feel better or they might think in a better way about their situation, problems, solutions and life and or they may act in a better way as a result of these 10 questions. This better dialogue. We are using a dialogical approach in our pie, building on the work of a Russian guy called Mikhail Bakhtin. This means we accept that none of us can see or know everything of the truth of a situation. We only see partly 
from our own unique perspective. Ideas get filtered through us and the truth is constructed in between us, in the dialogues we have, in relationships with each other. Thus, as no one knows everything, in this approach all perspectives are valued and encouraged to speak as everyone has something unique and potentially helpful and valuable to bring. Less powerful points of view are particularly encouraged to join the conversation, such as family, friends, peers, or people who have experienced similar problems, such as experts by experience. So for us, generating dialogue between different points of view is more important than rushing to the first solution that we think of or having to say that we know the answer to every problem. Powerful sets of ideas, like medical science, can make a contribution to the dialogue, but they are not allowed to monopolize the truth and silence all other potentially valuable ideas that people may bring. For example, people are free to contribute ideas from any talking therapy, but also from philosophical spiritual, religious, self-help, and mutual aid, as well as ideas from movies, documentaries, novels, poems, and literature. No one voice or set of ideas is allowed so much power that it silences all other potentially helpful points of views. If we only encouraged and allowed one way of thinking to be the author of the truth of our problems and solutions, then this powerful perspective would close down and monopolize the conversation and ways of thinking about solutions can become stuck. Dialogical conversations are different as they are always encouraging opening up and are curious about different ways of thinking about a problem and solutions because other people's perspectives can contribute unique ways of seeing that we cannot see from our limited point of view. Other people can see things that I cannot see. For example, others can see the back of my head when I cannot. There are different kinds of dialogical approaches. For example, the NHS are piloting some open dialogue services, building on the work of Jaco Sekula. Or there is anticipating dialogues, which are promoted by a guy called Arne Kill. Here in the northeast of England, we're trying a better dialogue approach, which focuses on the stages of collaborative problem solving in a dialogical way. So, here are my top 10 tips for getting better dialogue. Number one, bring the conversation around to exploring a real problem someone has in their life right now. Tip number two, explore how they feel about the problem. Are they anxious, worried, annoyed, angry, fed up, guilty, ashamed, excited, challenged, tired, or feeling a different set of emotions? Tip number three, ask about how the future would be better if this problem was solved. What is the better life that someone would like to be living that this problem is an obstacle to? Or more generally, you could ask what is the, uh, the idea of the good life that someone would like to be living in the future, which makes it worthwhile solving a problem. Tip number four, explore if there's any conflict between the person's will, what they would like to happen with this problem, and what other people would like to happen. That is, uh, consider that what we want to happen always has to pass through a zone of other people's will, which often leads to conflict, which needs to be negotiated in some way. These are the everyday dilemmas about submitting to other people's will or asserting our own will or coming to a kind of compromise about what, what, what should happen. Tip number five, explore what might be helpful in solving this problem. This is the area of cooperation with others, whereas the last question was about conflict. It is best to involve more than one person in the group dialogue when opening up a conversation and being curious about different ideas that might be helpful. Really helpful sets of ideas might lie in a remote context outside of the people directly having the conversation that day. So we could be curious about people who aren't there and ideas may exist within someone's social network, but uh, like their family or friends or 
colleagues, um, but they've not yet been put into words or said out loud. Um, so these might be ideas not yet known to the person experiencing the problem. So we create a safe space through this better dialogue where people can share and brainstorm ideas about what might be helpful to solve a problem and uh, it's it's okay and it's easy to let go of ideas quickly um, if someone doesn't find them useful which allows a flow of ideas rather than getting uh, stuck on the first idea that comes to mind. Tip number six is to plan a solution so build up the skill of planning so discuss and agree what might be a good plan to solve the problem Tip number seven, consider some of the actions that have been taken already maybe to try and solve the problem and there might be a bit of a think about um, ideas why they may not have solved the problem so far. Um, consider who's going to put actions in the future into the plan that you agreed in the last question going forward. Um, we can agree to go through these questions again, say, in... Um, in a day or a week or a month, whatever seems uh, the most helpful to the person experiencing the problem. This can allow time to pass for some action to be put into the plan and then we can reflect and consider in a day or a week or a month, um, you know, what's worked, what's not worked, has the problem been solved and just be open to maybe generating a different kind of set of answers to these 10 questions if the problem's persisting. So we're open to um, a process rather than feeling stuck. Top technique or tip number eight is to explore the bigger narratives or sets of ideas or stories with, within which someone is making sense of their life and their problems. Narratives are edited versions of our life that we tell each other all the time. If ten things happened last week, I might just edit and tell you three of them and wouldn't tell you everything. Um, so we're always telling these edited versions to each other in order to make sense of what we're doing. And it involves making sense of our present in terms of our past and saying what our future hopes are as well. Narratives can be religious or spiritual or secular. They might be around health, for example, being ill and getting better. Or they might be a different kind of narrative, like seeing our life being like a journey. Uh, and we've got lost on this journey, or we're stuck, or we're going through a difficult patch on our life's journey. Um, these can all help us to kind of visualize and articulate um, what we're doing in life. Narratives usually use metaphors uh, like this, such as uh, life's a journey. People can believe in one or more narratives at the same time. And our narratives can contradict each other, so don't worry about that. Um, if, if that becomes uh, apparent. Be curious about the story level and be mindful of our own narratives at the same time as we're asking about other people's. As humans, we can always change the narratives we believe in. So we're not f stuck or fixed in them. And changing a narrative can be a way to escape a kind of unhelpful story or narrative of our life. Any problem can take on a different meaning if we see it from a different perspective or within a different narrative set of ideas. So it's a different kind of level or way to move forward in life. But there's also the problem solving level or the, the habit level as well in which we can move forward with our life. For example, if someone changes to see themselves as, as a survivor of trauma rather than a victim of it, then for some people, the survivor narrative helps them move on positively with their life. But there are thousands of possible narratives people can try on, like trying on a pair of shoes to see if they fit. And if they don't suit, you can let go of them. Tip number nine is to consider together whether someone thinks they have any habits of thinking, feeling and acting that they've noticed regularly cause them problems in life. Now we all have a mixture of problematic and helpful habits. For example, uh, listening well or being slow to get angry can be good habits. And other habits like anxiously ignoring a problem can be problematic. So consider and be curious about patterns and habits that crop up regularly in someone's life. Often these habits vary along a dimensional range. For example, rather than saying I'm always or never a good listener, I'll lose my temper, it's probably more helpful 
to think about ourselves and others on a sliding scale. For example, if you think about a habit like um, listening well, you could say you never do that, you rarely do it, sometimes, often or always. This allows people to see that they can change their habits. For example, the more I listen well, the less I have the problem habit of not listening to others. My tenth and last technique for getting better dialogue is to ask if there's one thing that people have learned from taking part in the getting better dialogue, the conversation that you've just had, and ask them to think of one thing they would do differently if they held in mind this new thing that they've learned. Everyone taking part in the conversation can have a go at thinking of the answer to this question. And it's okay if you can't think of something straight away. Asking the question is useful in itself because it may prompt an answer at a later point in time. So those were my ten, top 10 tips for getting better dialogue with others. A lot of these 10 questions we do naturally and unconsciously with others in our everyday conversations. But working through them systematically can help us be more consistently helpful with others. Regularly building skills in these 10 areas by talking about them, rather than just chatting about the weather or last night's TV, these can be more effective and productive conversations. So, just to recap, um, why not have a go and see what happens? It's just about getting better at problem solving by chatting about the process. You can just describe a problem that you or someone you know has, explore how people feel about it, uh, consider how the future will be different if the problem gets solved. Um, consider if there's any conflicts of will between what people want to happen. Think about what might help in cooperating with others to solve the problem. Agree a plan to solve it. Think about what actions need taking. And reflect on the bigger stories, sets of ideas or narratives that people are living their life out in currently that are motivating them or holding them back. Consider any habits and patterns in our life that repeatedly causes problems. And finally, reflect on one thing you've learned and one thing you would do differently as a result of taking part in this reflective, better dialogue. We're going to try out these top 10 tips for questions in conversations with others and then ask those taking part to evaluate these 10 questions and tell us what they think about them. What difference do they really make? We are open to changing how we think and feel and act as a result of their feedback and in so doing to collaborate and co-create something new with others to try and create a community of practice where some new knowledge and practices can emerge opening up new possibilities of ways to get better we are all unfinished personalities a work in progress and open to change in an ever-expanding dialogue with others on an adventure journeying into an unknown and uncertain future with the hope that these 10 questions can help shape our conversations in a consistently helpful direction. Hi, I'm going to end the film there and open up the dialogue. Why not chat to someone about the ideas that uh, came into your mind when you were watching this film? Uh, you could send the link to someone else and they could share it, see what they think and just have a dialogue about it. Um, other things you could do is you could, um, if you're interested in Pi, you can sign up to uh, Robin Johnson's Pi link at pilink.ning. Uh, and you could, uh, if you want to, you could uh, like the movie, but only if you liked it. You could um, post a comment, and join the dialogue, and you could uh, subscribe <laughs> to the uh, uh, Dialogical Pi channel for future films if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, the content of which uh, future films I'm tolerating some uncertainty about in a kind of very dialogical way, but uh, we'll do something useful. Okay, thanks for watching and um, catch up with you next time.